Welcome to Future Explorations. I'm glad you can join us. My name is Victor Martinez, and this podcast is dedicated to the exploration of the diversity in perspectives around the concepts of change as a constant we humans need to embrace, long-term thinking as an approach for everything we should build and create, and the limits that our human nature, physiology, society, environment, and technology impose on us by their own intrinsic characteristics. It is your task and mine to identify the connections between all views, to discover the interdependence and complementarity of knowledge and ideas. In that way, we might get a clearer picture of what that sustainable future could look like and how we can design the transition to get us there. Today, I have the great pleasure to talk to Dr. Melinda Hogan. Dr. Melinda Hogan holds a PhD in philosophy from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. She studies the relationship between thought and language. Her focus is on the structure of mental representation, but she is interested in the nature of representation more generally. Dr. Hogan is interested in questions like, how are we able to use physical objects as symbols or signs for other things? What's the difference between meaning and information? How can biological functions enable us to form representations of the world? She has published on topics ranging from holism about meaning to the sense of certainty we have about our knowledge of our own mental states. Her current research has taken her into an exploration of privacy and why it is valuable to us. For inspiration, she continually returns to the wisdom of ancient sources, including Socrates, Plato, and the historical Buddha. Dr. Hogan, thank you so much for being with us today. It's an honor to have you. It's, it's my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you very much. So let's let's start just with uh, if you can tell us a little bit about yourself and 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 tell us um, what got you into philosophy and and whatever you want to tell us about yourself in a in a more personal way. Okay. Um, well, I have uh, been attracted to philosophy from a very early age. Um, I think. Plato was probably the first philosopher I read in, in high school. And then when I got uh, to university, there were a couple things I tried out, but I kept going back to philosophy. And so um, I received my, my undergraduate degree from UC Berkeley. And, um, and then after a few years out in the, in the working world, um, it, thinking for a while that I would be a lawyer, um, I, I ended up going to graduate school, doing my PhD at University of Wisconsin in Madison. And then um, always from the very beginning, I was interested in philosophy of language and um, an interest in meaning in what makes words mean things, what how is it that by making some sounds at each other, we're able to um, convey information about the actual world outside of us to each other? And that kind of question naturally leads into questions about the mind, because the obvious answer to the question, where do words get their meaning, is, well, we give them their meaning. Um, so there's something in us, right, that allows us to give meaning to external symbols. But then where does this come from, right? How is it that, um, that various um, uh, physical and chemical events in our brain can give rise to thoughts that have content and mean things? and allow us to represent things in the world. So this is what always interested me in, in philosophy. And, um, and uh, eventually, um, uh, as the years went by, I made my way to Canada. Um, and so I taught for a while at York University in 
in Toronto. And then I taught for a while at Dalhousie in Halifax. And now I'm here on the West Coast and I've been in, in Vancouver about 20 years and teaching at Kwantlen. Excellent, thank you. That, that was a, a very interesting. So it's, it's about philosophy of language. Yeah, in, in, um, in my PhD, I also had to understand a little bit the, the, the way that the brain uh, creates or interprets information in order to, to make decisions. It's, it's a, um, a very kind of computational way of, of, of processing information in order to rationalize that information and, and come up with designs. Uh -huh. So I, I remember reading about um, internal representations that we assume that exist because we don't really have any sort of evidence to, to prove that the brain is doing X or Y or Z uh, because basically the only, the only way that we have to, to you know, understand the brain activities with, with the scans that only show areas of activity where but, you know, they say that they light up, the brain lights up here or lights up over there. So we know, we know by logic that there are representations, there are figural representations, there are verbal representations, and there are some internal, and then you have, we have to externalize them. So I, I, I guess we can, we can maybe discuss this further down, but the, the, the translation between these internal representations, this internal processing and externalizing, there, there are also some, some, some things probably that are lost, some, some changes that are happening. What I'm, what I'm imagining is all those times that, that we think something and when we express it, things don't come exactly as we thought about that. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, and, 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 and only until we express it and we see people's reaction, we said, mm, no, that, that wasn't exactly what, what, I, tried, what I tried to say. So it, it, it may relate it to what, what you were saying about philosophy of language is, is connected to all that. Yeah, sure. I think so. Um, it's, um, you know, the actual, uh, as they say, the medium is the message. Of course, as you're in the act of, expressing the physicality of that act will make a difference to um, where you go with of course. Your expression. Yeah, um, there's, yeah, there's a ton of things to explore there. We will go there, we will go there. But starting from the very, very, very beginning, um, for an audience that just like me is not expert in philosophy, um, what, what is it? What is philosophy? Where does it come from? And why is it important? What would you say? Uh, okay, well, um, well, philosophy is is um, the activity. I like to say it's an activity of of questioning really fundamental assumptions. Um, and so it's it, this is not just me. It's very typical of philosophy professors to say philosophy is not a set of beliefs. It's it's not a a doctrine right, that you teach. It's rather an activity um, to familiarize people with. Um, it's, it's, it's rooted in our capacity as human beings, what makes us different from worms, right, is that we're able to reflect on our, our our minds on our own mental states and on our place in the world. And this is what gives rise to philosophy. So philosophy is the activity of questioning fundamental assumptions is how I would define it. And then the question, what's the difference between a fundamental assumption and an ordinary everyday assumption? Like I assume my neighbor is at home um, next door. And that's an ordinary assumption. That's not the kind of question that a philosopher, quay philosopher, would probably worry about too much. Um, the difference between an ordinary assumption and a fundamental assumption is if, if you're mistaken in the case of an ordinary everyday assumption, it's usually no big deal. I mean, it might cause a little bit of commotion in your life. In the case of a, a really fundamental assumption, um, like such as there are are people in existence besides myself. It's not all in my head or these aren't robots. It's some, you know, yeah. clever aliens designed to, um, well, if I'm mistaken in the case of a fundamental assumption, well, then that's 
that would cause me to have to really radically revise everything else I believe yeah. about the world. So that's how I would draw that distinction. So it's, you know, we have, we make in everyday life and in science, there are tons of assumptions that we don't usually look at, right? Yes. So, but we can be mistaken, um, even if it's not, you know, even if it, even if there's, um, you know, if it's very improbable that we're making a mistake, it's possible often. Of course. Right, in the assumptions we make. So this is what philosophers do or people when they're in a philosophical frame of mind stop to do. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's ex thank you, it's, it's, it's really clear. The, uh, this conversation then is, is leading me to two questions. One, the first one will be, then the, the idea of fundamental assumptions is linked to your understanding of your environment, your context. So it's, it's also a cultural, it has a cultural, um, um, it has a cultural value. It has a cultural component on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it could be. It could because be. Yeah. then, I mean, the, for, for, for me that I, I, I grew up in a, in a Western civilization type of, of education, uh, uh, European based, the, the, the first thing that we are taught about philosophy is, is the ancient Greek, is the famous, uh, the famous Greeks. Then, then we have some, some important famous names in Europe. Um, and from here, now and then, we maybe hear something about China, very, very bright uh, philosophers in China, maybe one or two, and then maybe one or two in India, but that's pretty much it. What could, could you expand a little bit more? Do you do you know any any other or any other like schools of philosophy? Any any other uh, be outside the, the the European classic uh, approach to philosophy that um, you can share with us? Well, I'm very I, I'm very attracted to and interested in certain um, strands of Buddhist uh, thinking, uh, which, uh, but it's not. Um, in my understanding so far, I, I don't, um, I think a lot of the same issues that arise um, in about epistemology, the theory of knowledge, and about metaphysics, the theory of what is, and about ethics, the theory of how, what we should do, how should we live our lives, they can arise in various cultural contexts. So um, yeah, with, with you, 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 you mentioned that when we think in the Western context, um, it, it goes back to the activity in, around the Mediterranean and, and um, in modern day Greece and Turkey and um, Northern Africa and, um, and we have Plato and the great Socrates, right? And, um, and, uh, and then Plato, and, and then through Aristotle, and more directly in some instances, Plato was just so hugely influential on, um, on uh, the development of thought in, mm -hmm. you know, uh, spreading into Persia and mm -hmm. spreading into Europe and so on, that it's, it's very hard to escape that. <laughs> it, it, it's very hard to, it, it, it's very hard to ignore Plato. Right, yeah. but it's what's interesting is if, if you look at uh, some of so people maybe some people watching this won't know that um, that Plato uh, gave us many dialogues um, in in which the various characters discuss issues of importance, and um, Plato um, expresses ideas which seem similar to ideas that would be prevalent in Northern India at the time. And um, so this is sort of amazing, right? That I'm not a scholar in ancient philosophy. That's not my research area. My research area is philosophy of language. Um, but this, but you, you get little bits of it, even reading Plato in trans, translation that he, and, and you realize that the historical Buddha was active just a hundred or two hundred years before um, the before the time of Socrates, who was Plato's teacher, and and that some philosophers immediately 
preceding Plato in time. Um, so, so you find ideas in Plato, um, even the idea of reincarnation um, mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. were out there. So it, it, I, it's, I, you know, there people, you know, the migrating that people did and the trading that people did yeah. and the, um, it's, it's, it's very hard. Uh, when yeah. you go back 2,000, 3,000 years to, to, <laughs> to, to like think in terms of the cultural differences we would think of today. Yeah, yeah, no, for sure. I mean, I'm, I'm, it's, it's pretty clear, clear that ideas also travel, no, and, and, yeah. and they influence other cultures. And then cultures are not something static, that they're always evolving and they're always exchanging with other cultures. And and I'm, again, I'm not an expert on, on, on history, but the, the, um, uh, the Silk Route and all the exchange in commerce that happened um, also between China and Europe um, certainly influenced many of those, of, of those exchanges. My, my question was more, more a, a personal curiosity because I have never heard of, of African philosophers. Or, or any 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 kind of school of thought on 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 pre-Hispanic uh, cultures in America, for example. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I I imagine that there may be many similarities in terms that uh, again these are my assumptions. Correct me if I'm wrong. We we create these fundamental assumptions based on our personal experiences while living in the world. You no, know? and I'm, I'm going back a few thousand years. Um, we, you know, humans, we watch the stars, watch the moon, you know, understand the cycles of rain and how plants die and how other plants grow. And, and it's through all that observation that we start to build our assumptions and start probably making, making, um, you know, taking these ideas beyond that that we can see and start, you know, coming up with, with this metaphysical approach of, of things that go beyond that. Mm -hmm. um, and I imagine that in many cultures, we, we have a similarity because we all live in the same planet, we are all humans and we all live the same experiences. Although I'm just, as I said, not personally curious to understand how culture also permeates and, 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 and adds to a, probably a different a different approach in some in some aspects. Again, no no, no I'm not expecting an answer. It's just a, I'm I'm just expressing a little bit of a, a personal curiosity. But before moving on, do you have anything you want to say about that? Um, well, um, I I think I agree with you that um, that <laughs> there are many of our fairly fundamental assumptions are, are ones that uh, that we inherit through the culture or cultures that we that yeah. we grew up in and um, and also you know famously um, when when people do enmesh themselves in a in a different culture from the one or the ones that they grew up in then they do they, this is often very eye opening right mm -hmm. <laughs> just for the and 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 causes people to reflect and so um, gets that philosophical um, um, part of us going yeah yeah, I know. It's, it's great. Um, so if you remember, I said that I had two questions. I made one. The other one connects directly to the main topics that I've been discussing in all these interviews. So I, I need to make a little bit of a pause here. Um, all the interviews that I've been doing have been running under three main topics that uh, are change, the idea of change, long-term thinking, and limits. The second question I had about the fundamental assumptions connects with the idea of change. Because um, I, again, assume that these fundamental assumptions um, are not static. They, 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 they change a long time. So that, that would be interesting to start exploring how, how um, different, uh, different philosophers saw the, the, the idea of change. And I remember you mentioned some interesting ideas from Heraclitus, uh, Parmenides, and Plato as well. So if, if we can start maybe exploring a little bit, what, what are these, these approaches to, to change and how we see change? Sure. Um, yeah, so change is an uh, interesting 
area in metaphysics. Um, it's, you know, we, how is change possible? Um, Heraclitus, a pre-Socratic philosopher, um, so, um, um, and um, a philosopher, of course, Plato knew about, and um, he, uh, Heraclitus thought that, that everything changes all the time. You can't step into the same river twice, he famously said. And, um, and he's, he came along early enough that, you know, we, mo we mostly have fragments. It, it, you know, we have to kind of piece it together what Heraclitus really thought. But he's a good um, uh, representative. We can, uh, we can use his name to label a, a position according to which like we'd say everything changes all the time in every way. And we could think about is is that possible? How 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 can that be? Um, if everything changes all the time in every way, then um, then what is it exactly that changes? Right? It seems like um, in order for there to be a thing that changes that undergoes change, there has to be some constancy, right? Some kind of constancy. Um, uh, constancy across time, um, this most straightforward way of thinking of it, right? Some constancy in order for there to be change. Um, and then another, another, another position on change among the, the so-called pre-Socratic philosophers, not all of whom uh, were dead by the time Socrates lived, was Parmenides, right? Who, who had a, it's an almost a kind of mystical idea. It's it, it all it's one, and um, and if change is an illusion, um, there there since there's this there's the whole. Um, it's 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 it it is what it is. It's in in and um, and it's unchanging and eternal. And um, so when we look at Plato, he, he, he kind of, he was very influenced by Parmenides, but he didn't, um, but, he, but he had a different kind of view from Parmenides and, um, and, 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 and he didn't take the view of Heraclitus. Plato is, uh, he thought, well, there's the, there, the most real part of, <laughs> reality or the only real part of what we experience are patterns and patterns we don't actually experience through the senses through our eyes and ears and nose and <laughs> it's patterns we apprehend through the intellect and this is the only kind of true true knowledge genuine knowledge that we can have is knowledge of the forms, the patterns that are, they, they are what they are eternally. Um, they're out of time. And, um, and, and, and then all the, the things we experience through the senses in the changing material world. Well, you know, our judgments are, are you know, off relative and unreliable, and the objects we experience through the senses are just not really objects of knowledge, Plato thought. So, so his, his sort of view about change went along, his, his view, his, his metaphysical view about change went along with a certain view he had about knowledge. It's fascinating. It's, it's truly fascinating. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to try to express a little bit the, the crazy ideas that pop in my head by listening to you, because I, I have interviewed an expert on complexity, and I've been, I've been in love with systems thinking and complexity theory for, for many, many years. Um, and, you know, linking also some other interest in, in physics and, and, and chemistry. I guess the first thing to say is that um, Many of, of, of these, you no know, um, Heraclitus, I'm sorry, the pronunciation to, I, from Spanish is my mother tongue, is Heraclito. 
So okay. Heraclitus um, and Parmenides, um, obviously they, they didn't know all the things that we know now. And even the concept of atom, you no, know, uh, it came it, it came from from uh, also philosophers in ancient Greece. The idea of some minimal, indivisible thing that creates everything in the universe that then we discover that is actually divisible and there are even smaller things than an atom but let's let's keep it simple the 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 idea of of heraclitus or Her heraclitus that all changes all the time seems very intuitive in the sense that we we see the world just by observation you know and it's and it's clear that things are changing sometimes Things don't appear to change as fast. Uh, I, I was chatting with uh, a paleocologist um, a, a while ago, and she was mentioning that mountains, for example, it seemed big and static, but they are actually constantly moving and erosion and, and having erosion and moving. And so we we sometimes probably we don't we don't see that change, but change is happening all the time. Mm -hmm. So. Heraclitus makes this, this very, very intuitive approach. Um, but nevertheless, what you mentioned that the, what then what is it about the changes that there, there is, the, the world will be completely different every single time. There must be a constant. Um, and I imagine this constant being, being precisely the, 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 the chemistry, the atom, the essence of, 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 uh, of everything that doesn't really change. I mean, I'm stretching a little bit things because that actually changes too. But let's let's keep it there. But then Parmenides says that all is one and all is an, all is an illusion, which also makes sense because the the idea is that from you know the single atom, um, the the matter that exists in the universe. This is something that I also talked to an astrophysicist in 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 a previous episode. Um, the amount of energy and matter in the universe is it is what it is and you cannot create matter out of out of nothing it's <laughs> always been there so all is one and and change in a in a in an abstract way could be an illusion understanding you know that that the way that change happens doesn't probably wasn't understood at that that time but then plato plato um says that this this idea of, of change is is based on patterns and i think pl what plato is explaining is 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 precisely what I, I, again this is just my my reflections on this i i, I just my, my my personal perception is precisely that these patterns is the way in which matter organizes and reorganizes and constantly changes and there is a mathematical this, let's say logic behind those patterns mm -hmm. so my my final saying here is is like i i see a correlation between all those schools of thoughts and i don't think necessarily they are wrong it's, it's just different 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 approaches to see the same thing or explaining the same thing um i, I don't know I'm, I'm just i'm just really literally thinking while i'm speaking so it makes any sense what i just said to you sure yeah yeah I, yeah, I like the way you um, you connected in the idea of matter from a physicist's point of view. It's like it, it, it's the total amount of matter in the universe is is what it is. Okay, okay. I'm I'm just I'm just trying to be sure that I'm not saying nonsense. That I, I, there is a, a little bit of sanity behind still. Um, okay, so moving moving on the the idea of change. I've been I've been thinking a lot about about change and and specifically what what drives all my work is is sustainability. I I, I really want to help humanity in any way possible, even if it's a tiny little bit, to approach more to a sustainable behavior. And and again, there is tons of things to say about that, but the 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 behavioral part of sustainability is clear in many ways that the behavior that we are and and by we i mean certain um, humans no not all humans uh, participate in the same way in 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 in, in climate change and, and the unsustainability of our planet but at least the ones that participate more especially in in richer countries the the uh, the key essential thing is a change in behavior and the behavioral change could mean losing uh, things. 
uh, and I'm I'm just trying to reflect here a little bit on on the the reluctance of people to change. That maybe there is there is a, a maybe I can chat this with a psychology a psychologist later on, but I, I would like to hear your your view on the idea of. Uh, reluctancy to change based on the idea of, of losing things and maybe the this this pain of 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 kind of grieving you no know, the idea of of how hard it is to lose things to lose and 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 by grief i i guess we we immediately go into the the worst things that happen in life like losing a loved one and and the the strongest and most difficult type of grief but but I, I guess it could be kind of on a spectrum, this idea of grief. Could be that possible worst, or could be small things, you no, know, that that you wanted and, and you could not get it. Um, I'm, I'm sorry for, for maybe a superficial comment, but you wanted an ice cream and you couldn't get it. So that 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 feeling of of I don't know if that could be even called a loss and 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 if there is a process of grief that that processing that that loss. So what 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 will you say about this idea of reluctancy to change based on 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 this fear of losing and 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 the hardness of grieving um that that's interesting i, I mean that, i guess there are several questions kind of wrapped in um in in there on the issue of, and climate change disaster and people's behavior um, I, I, it's, I've, I've recently realized that, um, it, you know, that it's, that's a central question, right? Whether we're going to change our behavior in a way to even substantially mitigate the worst effects of climate change. It, it may be that, you know, for the most part, people keep on with their, um, you know, they're all the all the things, right, that <laughs> are are causing climate disaster. Um, they keep you know, driving around in their big yes, yes based you know, consumption international flights, and but those are just like the tip of the iceberg of all the things I could mention, right? Or or one who was really versed in what's leading to climate change could could speak to. Um, so, you know, are we going to change our behavior <laughs> enough to make any difference is, a, is an interesting question. Um, but, e e you know, and then, e and, and I think that people who propose, try to propose solutions, they have to take a stand on that, right? Like whether we're going to change our behavior. Like if they think we're not going to change our behavior enough, then they're going to make proposals like, oh, we should... We should put all our energy in the, you know, ending up on, you know, making a home on Mars, right? <laughs> That's what we need to do, right? Because we're not going to change our behavior on Earth. And then there are other people saying, no, you know, we can change our behavior enough. But one way or another, we're we're going to be facing some very um, disturbing events more and more, and. Um, and so it's an interesting kind of change, right? To the, the, you know, the various weather disasters, for example, that we've had recently in, in, in BC and fires in Colorado, I mean, on and on and on. Species dying, behaving in strange ways. Um, there's, yes, there's loss there. Um, there's lots of opportunity, <laughs> I don't know if opportunity is the right word here, but I, I'll give us opportunity, lots of opportunity, lots of reason, maybe I should say, to practice grief, right? There's lots of reasons why people will be grieving. And, and I wanna say why people should allow themselves to grieve and, and why we should put effort into making pauses for grief and put effort, you know, pay attention to rituals around grief and allow grief because it's, it, it just, it, you know, I hate to see us 
go <laughs> living in a very shallow way and, and living in a way that's not completely um, allowing us to express all of what is most importantly human. So I, 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 this isn't an idea original, original with me. I was taught this idea. I was by an arbitrary stranger, right? Who was, <laughs> who I, we had no connection except for the fact we both felt grief over climate change. Mo, you know, conversation lasting two hours, but I had in this conversation, I was remembering, I was, I had my brother had, one of my brothers had recently died and I was in grief over the death of my brother. And this person I was talking to made me see how important it is to experience grief and to allow oneself to experience grief. And um, it's, you know, maybe, maybe it's something that other mammals feel, I don't know, but I, I tend to, you know, we hear about the behavior of elephants, mm -hmm. you know, for example, whether it's a, a mammal thing or whether it's a human thing, it's a really important part of our experience so that I think our loss would be much, much greater if we sort of went along our merry way doing, you know, minor changes in our behavior, um, but otherwise sort of going along our merry way, exercising short-term thinking, mm -hmm. uh, being, you know, wanting to satisfy our, our, our greediest impulses, and did it pause to allow what I think we naturally feel, but it gets our, our natural impulses get somehow um, blocked by our lifestyle. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's what I, I would say about grieving. Yes. I, I, and I don't think it, it, you know, I don't think any kind of loss that you might be sad about counts as grief. Yeah. I think okay. grief is much deeper than that. I, um, deeper in, in, in a sense I could, um, try to elaborate on yeah no it's, it's uh, yeah no I, I agree it was um, um, an assumption of mine it's, it's certainly something that I would like to explore a little bit more um, because I think the the um, the reluctance people to change is is complex there are there are many different reasons why uh, probably one more weights more than another and probably is, is not the same across the whole planet. There are, there are certainly differences, but the idea, the idea of exploring uh, all the different possibilities is, is something that I haven't really seen anybody or, or very few people doing. No? What, um, and, and one of the ideas of these, these podcasts and these interviews is precisely to, to hear different perspectives and to see how, how they connect. And how you know complex problems don't have one silver bullet solution that that we need to have many many different actions in different places in order to actually achieve something. Um, and uh, humans, we we tend uh, a lot to work on on silos to, to to you know we focus on on your bit of the problem and, and not seeing the, the connections. But again, that's uh, that's uh, a, a longer topic. So I, I just wanted to connect uh, uh, what we've been discussing about change and, and this idea of, of grief with uh, this, uh, the long-term thinking. You mentioned the, the short-term uh, uh, way of thinking that we normally have. What, what, what would be your, your uh, thinking on, on the idea of long-term thinking and, and humans? Maybe we can even connect it with, with your expertise in, in, in philosophy of mind. Um, because it, it strikes me how i mean there are certainly evolutionary reasons why we are focused only in the short term but how we why do we miss so much the the long term thinking and and the idea of of our our individual legacy for the greater collective of humans no i maybe i'm maybe i'm i'm just making big biases and super big assumptions but i i just remember reading 
for example, all the, the, the tragedies from ancient Greece. And, and it seems that one of the main points here is, is legacy, you know, is my name that will live forever and, and what is going to be said about me and all this type of, 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 of long-term approach to life, you know, is, is life beyond me. And I, I don't know if, if it's something that we have lost or is something that um, I don't know. I'm I'm not really sure what I'm what I'm what I'm trying to say, but I don't see it nowadays. No. What 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 do you think about it? Yeah. Um, again, that's there's a lot of um, a lot of complexity there. I know. I know. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm not sure how well I can defend this, but my sense of things is that there is a lot of nihilistic thinking, mm. and. And, and by nihilism, I mean, um, you know, people really uh, have this view that, that life has, has no meaning except that, uh, except that mm. what they can enjoy. You can, you, you can get this view expressed from, from different angles. So, mm -hmm. um, it, you know, you can, people will um, just kind of mindlessly, you know, go after social prestige or, you know, making more money. And, and it is true, you know, that money can, you know, make you happy in the, in the short term. And, and then you'll have p other people saying, you know, you've got to live in the moment. The moment is all we have. Um, and so really from a, a lot of different kind of, um, I want to say almost political perspectives, you could, you could you get the same idea that there's no sort of larger purpose in life. I, as soon as I said the word purpose, I found myself um, stumbling because I, it, it, <laughs> purpose, you know, it, it, you know, it's true uh, it, from an evolutionary perspective. It, or you know, from a, a, a natural perspective, life doesn't have a, a purpose, right? Human betray my um, theological views. It, it's, you know, it's not that we were put on the planet for a purpose and it's not that we evolved for, to an end, right? Yes. Um, for a purpose, that's not how it works. But that doesn't mean that individual lives can't have purposes. And that doesn't mean that life yeah. is meaningless, right? So, so, so I would not go along with nihilism. I would not go along with the idea that life is meaningless, even though I would go yeah. along with the idea that there's no sort of purpose why we are, are, are on earth. And I, th I tend to think the more, um, the more a person knows scientifically, uh, the more... Um, the, the greater sense they have of the meaningfulness of life often. I, I don't want to yeah. generalize about people, but I, I guess I'm saying that to, to find meaning and objects worthy of awe, you don't have to be um, unscientific or, um, or, or reject materialism or anything like that, right? It's often, you know, the greatest physicists who are the most... Um, struck, you know, by the enormity yeah. of, of what is out there. Yes. Wow. That, that is fascinating. I, I, uh, I agree in all the points. The, 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 the idea of purpose, the, the, the idea of life having a purpose, if, if we look at, you know, from a biology, a biological approach, you no, know, is, is the idea of reproduce, and survive and reproduce. That's what every single living organism is intended to do. And even the not, not so living, like the virus, no? The only purpose it has is to survive and reproduce, you know, continue the species and adapt, obviously, in order to continue surviving and, and, and reproducing. So if, if, uh, if we look at that approach, yes, life in, in, in this more kind of human sense uh, has no purpose. The idea of purpose is something that is being added or is something that we need to add um, as part of our uh, of, 
our cells of consciousness, no, that our, our understanding that yes, we exist, we are here. And I think it's even even greater now, or should be even greater now, because the 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 discussion I had with, with astrophysics was was enlightening in a way I can hardly describe in words, because the possibility that in life exists in other places in the universe is is mathematically like certain. No, is is pretty just by pure pure numbers um we know that should be somewhere there but by saying that doesn't mean that it's a it's an intelligent land and an and advanced civilization it could be a simple bacteria you no know, floating in a in a sea of ammonia who knows what um so the the possibility that humans are the only intelligent life form in the universe is is a possibility. It's actually something that could be. So, my my personal reflection. Advanced life form. Yes. Yes. Exactly. So, looking at at this really huge picture, and going back to this idea of of life having no purpose, it it becomes it becomes clear to me at least that we are in a privileged position where we can have we can give life a purpose in the understanding that we should be caring for life that we because that that power that we have of understanding and studying the universe and understanding the rules of of you know gravity and and how everything works it gives you that it gives us the tools to 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 care for life and not only our human life every single life um and and to try and 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 take it you know the the best possible future whatever that means uh is, is complicated but what what i'm 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 trying to get here is that the idea of giving life purpose for example what you were mentioned about uh your your theological principles and religion no um is is to me is clear that religion plays uh, an extraordinary important role for people to have that feeling of purpose and that feeling of of an objective or a, or, a, or, a, or a, yeah i guess just plain purpose for people that do not follow any religion the idea of purpose comes from from different different reasons i i don't think and again this is this is uh, just me um, I don't think there is anybody, I don't think nihilism actually exists in that sense. No, I don't think any any living organism can can go on without a purpose. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think nihilism That's is is a concept, not a reality in that sense. No, I mean there there you were saying that the, 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 there are groups that are called nihilists because they don't they don't they don't believe they they life has a purpose, so therefore they don't commit, they don't participate, they don't do. But in essence, what what the purpose is 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 a very hedonistic a, a, a purpose. No, it's, it's only themselves. Is is what they want to pursue with their time in life. This is again me just making making reflections while I'm speaking while I'm thinking, which is quite dangerous. <laughs> Well, <laughs> yeah, yeah, because that's the only way you can um, find out what's true is to say what you think as you think it and then test it. Um, but I think that uh, even if there are other life forms, there, it, which you say is a mathematical certainty in what we understand now, that there are other other that there is life elsewhere in the universe it's it's less likely that there is intelligent life it's very likely that there's life but it's less likely that there's intelligent life that's cool. um so that so that raises the question whether we have a special responsibility aside from whether we have a special responsibility we certainly have capabilities that bacteria don't have <laughs> to watch over other life or um, to um, do something to allow to to in the case of climate change on our planet to al allow life to continue 
and um, and even if you thought that 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 all that what mattered was human life, well, then there's still a reason to yes. <laughs> support life, other life on the planet because we're so dependent on it. Um, now, I think there's a way people can understand this interdependency um, without it, understanding it in sort of intellectual terms under, without understanding it through words. And then that takes us back to grief. I want to add to what was said about grief before that it, it might be right to think of grief as having a sense of loss, um, or it might be something else with grief. It might be that when we feel grief, we um, are having a kind of empathy for the thing which um, we have grief about. And it's obvious in the case of grieving over somebody that you love, right? You, your grief is about the fact they are in pain or they lost their life. And so grief might be one of those emotions that, um, that allow us to feel the sense of connection with other life on earth that we need to have, right, in order to do any work as stewards. I think yes. your, 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 your suggestion when yes. you talk about how we're, you know, we have these capabilities that bacteria don't have, there's a purpose we can find for ourselves yeah. to take care of each other right take care of the planet and and that is something that can keep people going <laughs> yeah no that's a beautiful thought how how grief can connect not only between humans but also between between species at the end yeah the idea the idea of of life overall being precious seeing other other life forms as precious as ours is a basic thing of survival because we need them it's a beautiful idea you know, to think the, the process that other organisms could, could have also in grief and how grief connects us. It's certainly is something that I will, be, I will be exploring a bit more, uh, a very, very interesting concept. In, in terms of, of limits, going back to the idea of, of philosophy of mind, what, what will be your take on the idea of, of, of limits? What, how can we understand limits from that perspective of philosophy of mind? Do you mean limits on our on our behavior, or do you mean limits on? I, I think it could be, it could be in in our behavior once for sure. I would connect limits I, in our knowledge. Do you mean? Yeah, exactly. That's what I was going to connect the the, the behavior with knowledge. How how we get to learn things, and maybe we can talk a little bit about about epistemology. And, and how that could be a leading way to understand the, the limits in which we, we must operate. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, one thing about philosophy, and you asked me this at the beginning, and I didn't, it was one thing I didn't address in what you asked at the very beginning is why, like, what is philosophy good for? Uh, yeah. What's it for? What's it for? <laughs> why, why, why is it good? So, you know, there are a lot of things you could say, but one thing is philosophy has as a value um, intellectual humility and um, um, intellectual honesty. Those are two slightly different things. And, you know, that comes from Socrates, although in other parts of the world, you know, people have a similar idea, but we associate it with the Socrates um, being aware of what you don't know, like having having the ability to know when you yeah. know some, really know something, and versus when it's a a belief, you know, when you know it's a feeling of certainty, but it, it, it but you know you could possibly be mistaken. So that's you know being honest with yourself and um, ab about what you know and what you don't know, and um, and then the related quality of um, not feeling compelled to um, make it seem to that you know stuff that you don't know <laughs> in, in every circumstance. I mean, sometimes it's useful, right? <laughs> um, but, it, um, but that's the, the intellectual 
um, these, these are qualities that, that it, a person um, can acquire over time in, in practicing philosophy. And it's, um, <laughs> it's a useful in all kinds of contexts relevant to dealing with climate change, right? Like it's, it's relevant in contexts of where, uh, we, you know, we could talk about the, you know, current, the political discourse and how it's in, in many quarters not uh, going well, <laughs> right? Yeah. You know, how we could talk about polarization and so on. Well, if, he, if the discourse continues on in that way, we're not going to be in a very good position to, you know, deal with climate change, right? If we're, if we're not um, good at talking with each other in, you know, in designing policy and so on. Um, yes. So those, those kind of qualities that you get, both, both the honesty with yourself and with other people and um, humility and, you know, having a kind of habit of not thinking that you know when you don't know. Like, um, yes, you the idea of, of, of being aware that, that we don't know it all, that there is some things that we still don't know and, and, and the humility that needs to be behind that. I yeah I I find it quite interesting the 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 point here of of knowledge creation and the difference between you were saying you know, beliefs and fact and true and knowledge and data they are completely different things the idea of accepting knowledge based on evidence knowing that evidence will be coming continuously and like any any good trained scientific no uh, scientist sorry will will change its position according to new evidence that's that's one of the most basic things any scientist uh, uh, is is firstly trained to but it's not the same in general public general population because it clashes with worldviews and with personal interest mm -hmm. and that's very important the part of of self honesty no, but that 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 you were mentioning, the the idea of just um, acknowledging the information that confirms your beliefs, and and only considering that the, the people that agree with you, um, that is that is not being honest with it with oneself. No, and the approach from from a philosophical perspective is, well. If, if I'm being honest with myself, I have to start with the assumption that I, I don't know many things. It has to do with whether a person really cares about truth, right? Because why bother being um, honest with yourself or with other people about what you know and what you don't know, unless you want to find out what's really true, right? <laughs> like why, why bother otherwise? Okay. That's that's precisely what I what I was saying about worldviews and 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 what I was trying to to connect with with loss and grief, you no, know? because it, it may it may happen in a in a subconscious level, you no, know? the idea that if I receive information evidence that contradicts the beliefs that I have according to you know how the world should operate, and that not only that but on top of that it puts in danger. Um, let's just put it plain some some personal comfort or personal commodity or per something that is personally good for me obviously i'm gonna reject that it's, it's a logical reaction it's like fooling oneself and it's, it's a lack of honesty and i will even say like goes against self-preservation instincts no goes against them yes which which, which goes against them that uh, one that practices this lack of honesty, honesty. This yes. lack of honesty and and yes. rejecting rejecting evidence. I, so I'll I'll try to make um, probably an, an example. It is absolutely clear that driving your car produces CO two and CO two contributes to climate change. When the evidence comes and says we need to stop using cars, the 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 immediate thought is, well, yeah, I understand the evidence, but I'm not going to do it because it's, it's, the, it's the easy way that I have to go to work and I, it's a life necessity, no? which, is, which is a good argument in that sense. But stopping there, I don't know if, if it could be called that lack of honesty and the idea that we are then 
going against our, our own self-preservation basic instincts. Yes. Is the immediacy of, of the benefit against the, the long-term investment? Uh, there, is, uh, there is also the immediate, the immediate benefit and the payment, like eating a chocolate. I feel really good now, but it's gonna, I'm going to pay it later. But because I'm going to pay it later, I don't really care much about later. And anything that is, is like, for example, saving money is going to be good for me in the long term, but it doesn't provide any benefit, immediate benefit right now. So I don't do it. No, I don't save because it doesn't have any, any immediate benefit. So what I'm saying is I'm, I'm trying to connect. Maybe I'm, I'm, I'm overstretching things too much, but I'm trying to connect that with the idea of acknowledging evidence, acknowledging the clear message that we need to change behaviors and also connecting with, with the lack of honesty and, and even the, the self-preservation instinct that goes against this, this idea of, of rejecting the long-term benefit for the mm -hmm. immediacy of, of, of the need. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I think that um, it's helpful if see the big picture <laughs> is what I want to say. Aim for um, what's, what's true <laughs> in the big picture, right? Not in the short run. Yes, if people um, were willing to change, if we were, if I have to say we, right? Um, yeah. if, if we were I am there too. more constant and more willing to change our beliefs or in, in light of evidence and uh, change the, um, the beliefs on which we act in light of evidence, we'd be much better off, <laughs> right? Because I would suggest that would, if, if we're more likely to change our beliefs in light of evidence than we are, then, um, then we're more likely to do things that are um, useful in, for the long yeah. term and not the short term. But, but I think there are a lot of factors, right? Why people are um, not so willing <laughs> as would be ideal. Yes, for sure. Change their complex. beliefs in light yes. of evidence, right? And it, it's partly because, I, you know, I think that it, it's, it's truth is not, is not sort of like, they're not often driven for truth to, you know, to seek truth for its own sake, right? It's, it's more like, um, you know, do whatever you think is, is, is useful um, in, the, in the short term. But the other thing is people, um, you know, people like to hang on to their beliefs because they, a, lot, a lot of times people think beliefs define who they are, right? I, and I think that's quite actually rampant. You know, as a scientist, you you will think of your you know your beliefs, their attitudes you have. You know, what if, if the belief is supported by evidence, then keep it. If it's not, you know, then hold Go judgment. On. You know, don't you know, don't grip it. And but a lot of people they they would feel like they had no substance, like there was nothing to them. And, mm -hmm. unless they had the beliefs that they have, right? So I'm a this, I belong to this group, I'm a this. So don't make me change my beliefs because if I have to change my beliefs, who would I be, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I think that's it. I think that people don't think of beliefs as things that in the you know first and only instance you should hang on to, right? Yes. <laughs> it, it, depending on the evidence you have, they think of beliefs as something that defines them. Certain traditions say that there is, the self is pretty insubstantial, right? There's not, it's not like there's a soul. And so, you know, people grasp after anything that'll make them feel solid. And so this collection of beliefs that, do, that yeah. defines who they are. So if they have to give up those beliefs, who would they be? They don't know where to go, what to do if they have to give up the beliefs that they have. And I could give examples, I guess. 
Yeah. No, I, 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 yeah, we are, we're running out of time. It's, it's been more than an hour now. It's, it's been fascinating. But yeah, I, I agree with you for certain noise, phenomena of, of humans creating groups and, and using those groups and those labels, those categories to find identity, I guess, no, an identity. And that connects also with, uh, with purpose, what we were discussing before. Yeah, um, yes, it does. I'm thinking could beliefs and purpose could be reoriented in, in light of enough knowledge and information to, to understand that there is a, there's the need for a change. I'm also thinking that some, some of those beliefs are not necessarily against each other. I'm, I'm pretty sure that we have much more commonalities than differences. Mm -hmm. But for some strange reason, we, we focus more on the differences and forget the commonalities. So I, I like to finish the episode with uh, the same three questions uh, to all my guests. And these questions are uh, very uh, philosophical. They are kind of open-ended. There is no right or wrong answer. So whatever just comes to you, that will be, that will be great. So the first question is, uh, the longest living species are cyanobacteria that have existed for around 2.5 billion years. Um, and for comparison, the oldest standing human-made structure is just a few thousand. So how do you see human development feasible from this point of view? Do you think we could be as successful as a species as cyanobacteria and live around for 2 billion years? That, that's an interesting question. Um, I, when I uh, first uh, started hearing what you were saying, um, in that question, it, I, I thought you were asking if we could, if being successful in the way that those bacteria are successful is something that we could intentionally um, pursue <laughs> or you know, try to achieve, a kind of success we could try to achieve. But of course, when we're talking about biological adaptation, it's something that um, it sort of happens to a species. It's not something right. that anybody achieves um, um, and through enacting intentions. Um, so, um, like, you know, the, the elephant has a wonderful adaptation with its trunk, but this is not something that the elephant figured out would be a good idea in its, its environment. So um, generally, adaptations are not anything a species chooses or attains by effort. But then, um, I mean, I guess in this interview, you're very interested in how we see ourselves going into the future. Um, and um, of course, one of our famous adaptations as human beings is our large brains. And, and uh, with, the, with our large brains, the ability to respond flexibly mm -hmm. to problems so it, it, it we don't we don't do the same behavior each time a problem arises even a similar problem we can we can try out different behaviors so so and and, and of course also our big brains give us culture and the ability to pass down knowledge to um, generations through means other than genetic um, I mean, I guess other animals, some other mammals have culture in, in uh, at Goodall, right? The chain Goodall, I think. Yeah, they, that, yeah. But not, not, not like we do. Of course. <laughs> I don't, I don't yeah. think I'm being too, um, you know, too species um, centric. <laughs> <laughs> by making a claim like that about culture. So, you know, so it seems like, um, you know, maybe there, we could aspire to be <laughs> successful in the way that certain bacteria have been successful um, because we can have some effect on the way we change mm. over time. I mean, I, I know that there are, that you know, what's a big topic, of course, right now is genetic engineering and and um, and the ethics of that, and the you mm. know the scientific possibility of 
of that um, the big question marks. My sense is that it wouldn't be very useful to try to engineer ourselves to be to, to cope with what's going to be coming down to us that we can predict in the near future. But you know, maybe we can um, affect our own evolution by putting ourselves in environments that that where you know certain traits would get selected be you know more likely to get selected for than others and so you know we're kind of doing that right now uh, yeah. with, not necessarily in a positive way with um, precisely yes online all the all the uh, uh, what we're doing to our brains living our lives online and and I'm thinking about attention spans in particular. And, you know, that's just starting to be studied now. And so I, I don't know if we would ever, if, if we can really uh, bring it about that we can be as successful as, as these bacteria that you mentioned. Um, but that, you know, that said, who, who are we anyway? I mean, we're this species, but we're continuous with other life forms. So, um, so yeah, I'm not quite sure how to answer that question. I think there's some possibilities for us as, yeah. as human beings, but I'm not too, um, I, I'm not myself too focused on when, when you say our success. It, I'm not too focused on human beings as such, as opposed to life on Earth in, in general. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I like much, very much that last part because, yeah, it's, it's, it's about life overall in, in, in general. Yeah, uh, so the, the, the question is obviously to, to provoke some, some thoughts that we rarely, we rarely think about. No, we, we, I think we humans have this idea of our personal life how long that may be if we're lucky you know 80 90 years if we're lucky but the, the the importance of our actions during our lifetime have implications that go beyond our lifetime and and precisely i i think it's important to to explore even if it's from this this just this philosophical point first i, I think you should start from this philosophical point precisely know what 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 would we would like to see ourselves grow as a species and what should we be doing now as individuals to 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 help achieve that in like the very long long term and yeah it's it's it's, uh, it's a very complicated question and and i know there are so many things to discuss about you know evolution and the context and uh, you know there are people now saying that that in order to cope with what is coming we need aug augmented uh, abilities so becoming some sort of cyborg with chips that are attached to your brain that allows you to go you know think faster think uh, have more memory or whatever you know a, a specific skill and and i'm not necessarily against that no i'm i'm just i'm just trying to provoke people to think about it no if 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 we want that if that's the way we should go and what should be you know, take take a time to, to to think and and try and go deeper in the questions to be as honest and ethical as possible to ask the, for the goods and the wrongs and and just be aware of of what decisions uh, we are making no but anyway that's that's a lovely answer i'll i'll go for the second one i hope it's easier um what what does it mean for you, or if it is at all important, the importance of failure in discovery and human progress? Um, well, we have we have science, right, <laughs> and um, and our understanding of the way science works is it it succeeds by its failures, of course, right? The hypothesis is arrived at. Um, Sometimes it's a very creative new idea that is inconsistent with other things we think we know. And sometimes it's a, a more workaday idea that is consistent with most of what we know but hasn't been tested yet by experience. And then of course there's lots of background assumptions when we test any particular hypothesis that are also being tested but sometimes we don't even know what those assumptions are we're not we're not always aware of all of the possible role of, of background assumptions in the process of confirming or disconfirming a 
hypothesis. So, you know, we have science and we, and we, you know, 20, what century are we in the 21st century human beings that we are, we have, this is, you know, we're very conscious of it. So, so we can use, you know, our consciousness of how science works in our own lives and, and you know, learning naturally happens through mm -hmm. um, in any case, whether it's very conscious or not, it, um, and it, responding to failures. Yes. No, no, I was I would just follow up uh, with that question. Uh, why, why do you think then, um, not all of us, but in, in, in not in all, all cases, but most of the time we punish failure? Um, if, if, what, if I understood correctly, you're mentioning this is, is part of a natural process that we need to go through. Why do we punish it? Um, well, <laughs> there are probably lots of answers to that. It, it is true. First to come to mind. It, it is true, isn't it? Um, that um, people uh, uh, um, suffer a lot over um, over failures, small and large, just um, in, in the little 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 um, moments in a person's life, and um, in the big decisions that sometimes mm -hmm. seem to have not turned out well. Um, and there, you know, we, we were just talking about evolution. Maybe there's, maybe there's a evolutionary advantage to suffering over your failure, but I, I doubt there is at, at, as much advantage as there would be, um, that would balance out the amount of suffering that people undergo in, through that. And of course, you know, a lot of it, the reason is, is cultural and social pressures about and expectations about how a person should be. And um, so, it, it, you know, I, I guess you could think about how we might um, design an ideal society, maybe it would be one in which people didn't, um, didn't actually suffer over over failures. Um, it, it, it's not clear how much that just usually. I remember being very. I, I was going to say usually people. I think um, it, just to know that something failed is enough for them to learn from the failure. Mm -hmm. Right? They 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 don't oh, off. I, you know I don't know how general to make this but often it, it, there would it, there serves no purpose to drive the point home to a person that they you know this was a mistake <laughs> things went wrong yeah and so it um it, you know maybe sometimes that kind of thing has purpose but uh, often it won't have it and, and i was going to say I, I remember sort of being very very impressed when I first arrived at, at graduate, graduate school in philosophy by the fact that <laughs> all I had to do was make a mistake and nobody had to say anything for it for me to, <laughs> to be affected by the fact that mm -hmm. I made a mistake, right? It was no, there was, you know, just complete, I, I, I had lovely teachers I, I was very, very lucky, um, I think. Yeah. Wonderful no. teachers. And, but it would just kind of shocked me that they, like, you know, <laughs> I never got chastised, right? All, all you know, all, yes. I had, all that had to happen is for me to know that they were conscious of what yes. I was conscious of <laughs> in that moment. That was enough. I see. No, no, great. You're right. It's, it's, it's about you know, the space in which failures occur and, and if, if it's a safe space and you talk about consequences and pain, which is obviously uh, important to, to keep in mind. But moving on. Uh, last question. Um, so describe for us the future of your choosing, the, your ideal future. Um, and thinking about the future, you can think a hundred years from now, a thousand years from now. 10,000 years from now, if you want, and how that future will look like to you? Well, um, I, again, this, this, this is a, a very interesting question. I used to be very interested in, in the future. I find these days that it's very hard to envision a future 
thinking, and, and I'd like to address all those three different time periods that you talk about. Okay. Um, and from what I understand about climate change and so on, it's, we're in for a lot of change <laughs> in the next hundred to a thousand years. So, you know, a thousand years from now, I don't expect um, us to be very much different from how we are, but I imagine there, to, there will be a lot fewer of us and we'll be living a lot more simply. And what I hope is that we, we will have learned from our failure, failures now in mm -hmm. this and, and you know one thing said at the very the onset of the pandemic that sense of community a lot of people seem to have just from the fact that we were you know all across the globe experiencing this this virus and this and the disruption that it brought around so you know, maybe that will, but that there is kind of positive effect I felt in the way people were speaking to each other and so on. But, yeah. um, and, and so I'm, you know, so I, I like to envision a few, the, the people a thousand years from now still being able to profit from the uh, effects of having gone through lots of trauma together. Um, benefit maybe is a better word than profit in the, in a hundred year term. Um, that's, it's, I, I, I've seen great struggles in the context of climate change going on to develop democracy further. And it's going to, I expect there to be huge setbacks and mm -hmm. um, in the near term, right, in the next 25 years. And used to have an ar argument with a colleague about what was the most important issue sort of social political issue of the day you know for me it was well um had recently become interested in, in privacy and that's you know and what you know that brings along with it a lot right like autonomy and and many other things that we value and it's threatened right now mm -hmm. in a way that we put our whole lives and souls online in a context of um, a society which sort of globally is getting more and more extremes in in wealth and power. Yeah, and, yeah. and so, you know, so that was what I said, like, we, and he said, no, that's ridiculous. Climate change is the, is the most fundamental, important issue of the day. It's the issue of the day. And, you know, and that's the, you know, that's where, you know, anybody who wants to be any kind of forward directed activists you know you need that's what you need to focus on but I, you know my response was well we're not going to be able to yeah. do anything to mitigate the worst effects of climate change if best features of liberal democratic societies are um, are closed off you know through this um, movement or authoritarianism that seems to be happening in lots of parts parts of the world. So, so I have a very bleak vision of what's going to be happening in the next hundred years and a sort of better vision of what, where we might be a thousand years from now. There are people like, um, who have this idea that what we may need to be doing in the face of climate change is transporting everybody to Mars, right? Or <laughs> not, every, like, not transporting everybody to Mars, but a few people, right? Or to some place, right? Like make a planet somewhere habitable, use all we have, right? All we have to try to plant humanity and so, um, wow. some further planet. I'm not sure about that as a, as a, as a, a vision of even where we might 10,000 years from now, maybe if we look far enough in the, in the future, but it, as far as a more short term, you know, within the next thousand years, as a, as a method for dealing with climate change, I don't see it. Method for dealing with the worst effects of climate change. Um, I don't see it. Um, it's, it's, it doesn't seem to be, it, it, I think we need to look more at, 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 at how we are functioning as human beings and how our societies are functioning. We need to get more to the roots of the problem, that the problems that have um, 
yeah. led us to to live in a way that has brought about this destruction to our planet. So I don't know, 10,000 10, years from now, it's, it's, it's hard, to, you know, it's like, we'll, probably will be pretty much the same unless we, as we are now, uh, uh, except if we work at, at, at defining really a, a fundamental ways we can change. Yeah, for certain. The the I guess the the final the final idea here may be that it's up to us. We still we still have a little bit of chance to to make a, a, a significant change in order to make what it may seem a very very dark and gloom and doom future into something that is is uh, is much more positive and there are so many things to 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 explore there but your 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 answer is 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 pretty clear there are there are some really difficult questions to have and some some really hard questions to make i appreciate very much your your answers and and thank you so much for being in the uh, in the podcast today it's, it's been truly an honor thank you very thank much you. thank you for um, having me on it's It was a pleasure to talk with you. Thank you. This time, I would like to start the final reflection slightly differently. Please bear with me for a moment. The word philosophy has its etymological origins in ancient Greek philos, which means love, and sophia, which means wisdom. Therefore, it is the love of wisdom. It is the study of the fundamental nature of knowledge, reality, and existence. I like very much the definition given by Dr. Hogan. It is an activity of questioning fundamental assumptions. I particularly like it because how she emphasized that it is an activity. Activity to me tells me that requires intention. It is something that needs to be done, requires work, effort. It is a process to engage in, and that can take you places uh, you have not intended or not even imagined. It's not just a recipe to follow. I find this particularly important because after almost two decades I have spending reading, listening and learning about sustainability, it is quite clear to me that finding a solution to our sustainability problems, in particular climate change, all comes down to a deep philosophical question. What do we want for the future of humanity? and life in this planet, because most of the damage we know is self-inflicted, and we are caught up in a circle of dependency we, where we know about the damage, but we cannot find a way to stop, uh, it's very similar to an addiction. That is, I think, because we have failed to do the work of questioning fundamental assumptions. And as with any activity, we get better with practice, and we don't philosophize often enough. Uh, we have left the ball run for far too long without questioning some fundamental assumptions. Things like how we value things. We seem to only focus in monetary value. That does not capture many aspects that are now clear are fundamental for human well-being and overall life in this planet. Or even question human well-being itself. We have let economics decide that the standard value to measure progress is GDP gross domestic product, which similarly does not capture fundamental values and needs for human life. So what do we want? That is the what for of the final questions of the episodes in this season of the podcast. If we can imagine the future we want, then we can work our way back to find the path we need to follow. Economic models, political systems, and all other human creations are not definitive, immutable, universal laws. I think we should allow ourselves to have this type of discussions more often, to allow ourselves to question fundamental assumptions about democracy, capitalism, or many other things, uh, without the fear of being banned, cancelled, or called names, and doing so because of pure love of wisdom, because we want to be wiser, better people, a better civilization. Dr. Hogan and I also talk about meaning and purpose of life, <laughs> very light stuff. Um, first, I would like to propose to differentiate those two terms. I've been giving it a lot of thought. I see meaning as the action of assigning sense or definition to something 
try to find a logic for it to be valid. Purpose, on the other hand, is the reason why we do something or something gets done. In that perspective, life, from a biological point, has no meaning other than, just like any other living organism, we have been imprinted in our genetic code, code the instructions of survival and reproduction. Purpose in life, on the other hand, is something that is not given to us. Therefore, we should, we should define it. It is our task to decide what we want to do with our momentary lapse of time, of consciousness in this planet. That is such a privilege, and not even all humans have it. Dr. Hogan said a phrase that I find so accurate. It explains my precise feelings and reasoning for many years now. She said, the more a person knows scientifically, the greater sense they have about the meaningfulness of life. What I get from that is that the mere fact that we are here, you are listening to me, and we have consciousness of our existence in this minuscule dot of dust in the universe called Earth, and we can understand it and we can manipulate it with such great responsibility. That understanding and power has been given to us by science. The last point we discuss, which is of great importance, is about honesty with oneself and humility to differentiate between what we know, what we believe, our feelings, and etc. It's about people's care for truth, even if it goes against our core values or core beliefs. Um, I know, how do you define truth? That, let's leave it that for another episode. This is, this is already quite enough. Once again, thank you very much for listening. Uh, please comment, share, and subscribe. Uh, there are more interesting episodes coming. Uh, we will talk about cognition, economics, agriculture, food production, and, and others. Thank you very much, and see you here soon. Future Exploration is produced and written by me, Victor Martinez. Music is composed by Rafael Crux, Udayana Lugo, and Mauro and Daniel Martinez. Future Exploration is licensed under the Creative Commons with attribution and non-commercial use.